Hey everybody, thank you for coming. Uh, I know this is right after lunch, and so I will do my best to uh, try to keep you entertained, both to keep you awake as well as to keep myself awake. Um, so I'm Eric, I'm the technical product manager for Ecosystem. I've been working at Puppet for about four and a half years now. I've been working on Puppet since 2008, and I've been doing configuration management for sort of a scarily long time now, almost 20 years. It's actually really strange for me to be back here in San Diego. Uh, as Luke mentioned, the Lisa Sysadmin conferences were held here on odd years uh, throughout the 2000s. And um, in fact, this venue in Lisa 2003 was where I met Luke in person for the first time. We knew each other from the CF Engine mailing list, but uh, hadn't actually met in person. It was a very strange uh, conference that year because the Santa Ana winds had uh, combusted the uh, the hills, and it was uh, there were fires raging throughout the throughout San Diego, to the extent that there was a steady rain of ash coming down all over the uh, conference center. So instead of it being nice and sunny and pleasant like you see outside now, there were um, men with push brooms sweeping the ash into giant piles, and uh, the, all you could see in the sky was a, a you know a sort of sick haze with a red orb up there, and we were like. Well, it looks like they've relocated Lisa to Mordor this year. That's, uh, that's, that's not what we expected. But it was a very cool conference, a cool time, and really, uh, as, as Luke mentioned this morning, uh, a lot of the concepts and the ideas that we uh, think of as today as being part of just how configuration management works were sort of hammered out in, uh, in, in this venue and at those conferences. So it's really cool to be back here. Before I did systems administration, I studied critical analysis and literature and audio engineering at USC in Los Angeles. And so when I started talking through, I uh, got into the technology stuff, now I do product management, I talk a lot about roadmaps and uh, the layers of metaphors that we use to talk about this stuff sort of bothered me. Uh, I think at one point I said something like, okay, we're gonna have to do a, a deep dive into the roadmap for our platform. And then I punched myself in the face immediately it struck me that the only way out of this metaphorical maze was to go all the way through it. So let's start off with a definition. Um, what is a metaphor? As it says here, it's a uh, figure of speech that's not uh, applied to something that's not literally applicable. And uh, although I generally agree with the concept that usage defines meaning in language, in this particular case, I'm a prescriptivist, and I will never use the word literally to mean figuratively. Thank you. Yes. Shout out, to my, shout out to my fellow grammarians there. It's great to see you. Um, and the other part of this that's interesting is uh, the, it's the thing is uh, it's representative or symbolic of something else. So keep that in mind as we go through this talk. So if anyone uh, saw my talk from last year, I talked about the history of Puppet uh, over the last decade or so. And uh, you might recall that I drew heavily from Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey and gave some examples of the different phases of that journey through the lens of some uh, some terrible movies and some not so terrible movies. Well, Joseph Campbell is my go-to person when I'm thinking about uh, mythopoetic journeys, but George Lakoff is my go-to person when I think about metaphors. He wrote this book with Mark Johnson in 1980. It's called Metaphors We Live By. And in it, the authors start off with a premise that our conceptual system, the way that we think about the world, is largely metaphorical in nature. The way that our higher order brains work is by interpreting the world around us in terms of metaphors rather than understanding each individual thing that we come into contact with from first principles. The second point, they argue, is that as a consequence of our brains reaching for metaphors to come to grips with the world around us, we gain a partial understanding of our experiences and the parts that we grasp versus the parts which elude us are determined by the metaphors that we use to describe those things. I'll give you an example. Since I love recursion, here's the sentence that I just said that the consequence of our brains reaching for metaphors to come to grips with the world around us, we gain partial understanding and the parts we grasp versus the parts which elude us are determined by the metaphors we use. So in this sentence, I used different aspects of what Michael Reddy, who Lakoff uh, cites in, in the book, calls the conduit metaphor. It's a systematic way of understanding ideas as objects where a speaker puts an idea into words which are sort of like a physical object, and transmit those words along something that's sort of like a, a conduit or a channel to the listener 
who, or receiver who then unpacks those ideas and somehow shoves them into their brain. Um, so in this sentence, I'm compared thinking and metaphors to reaching for a physical object. Understanding it is like coming to grips with it or grasping it, and not understanding is that the object eluded us. So this is what Lakoff calls a systematic metaphor, and we can use it in lots of ways, mapping different properties of physical objects onto ideas and generating a lot of very reasonable sentences like, it's hard to get an idea across to him, or uh, he clung to his beliefs, or this talk is packed with meaning. But um, critically, there are some aspects of ideas that do not map to physical objects. Either they require some context, or the meaning is open to interpretation. I mean, all metaphors are necessarily partial. They're necessarily incomplete. If uh, Lakoff argues that if the metaphor was an exact representation of something else, it would actually be that thing. It wouldn't be a metaphor anymore. So uh, the idea that um, some characteristics are going to be illuminated and some will be occluded is, uh, is central to their thesis. Um, another example is we may think of time as money as a central metaphor. We can sort of spend time, we can save it, you, but um, it's not complete. There's no way, unlike money, for you to give me your time and me to give that same time back to you. It's gone. I can give you the same amount of time, but it's not exactly the same thing, unlike money. And at this point, you might be wondering, why am I spending my time listening to this? I'll come to the point. But first, I must pause for a brief biological dis digression. Was anyone here at Atomicon in Portland earlier this year? I was. Uh, this, so this may look familiar. This is Nigel giving a talk about operations metaphors, which also references Lakoff. He talked about how our use of metaphors in operations, these are words like war room and a post-mortem, um, influence how we think about those events. And although I had submitted my abstract for this talk before he had done that one, neither of us were aware of the, each other's topic. And in biology, this phenomenon is called parallel evolution, which interestingly happens a lot in Australia. These Australian mammals, the uh, marsupials with the triangles next to them, are, uh, they fill the same ecological niche as their North American counterparts with the, uh, the circles. But, you know, they are marsupials. They carry their young in pouches rather than being placental mammals and giving birth with a, uh, to their young with a placenta. Uh, they ended up looking very similar to the uh, North American mammals because they filled the same ecological niche, as I said, and they adapted to fill that niche in a way that was uh, most, you know, the most appropriate expression for that ecology. So, for instance, we have, like, an anteater that, you know, needs a long tongue and a snout to get into ant. Um, uh, into the ant hills, and um, they, so they have common ancestry and a common purpose, but they evolve with a key difference because they're from Australia. So this is called convergent evolution or parallel evolution, and that's how we ended up with this talk. Go check out Nigel's talk on video. Um, it's really interesting, and though we have the same starting point, it ends up in a very different place to mine, which is probably because he's Australian. <laughs> anyway, back to metaphor. I want to use this framework to talk through three related metaphors that we use every day. Um, and each one illustrates sort of a different aspect of metaphors as concepts. The first one is about platforms, which Lakoff calls a conventional metaphor. We have puppet, a novel or unconventional metaphor by contrast with the conventional ones. And we have roadmaps, which is a complex metaphor that bundles up several orientational concepts into a system. Hopefully this makes some amount of sense and doesn't descend into a fiery hellscape of gibberish or biz speak or nonsense. We'll see how it goes. So a conventional metaphor is something that arises naturally as we think about an object. They tend to blend it to the background, and in some ways we don't even think about them, and they don't feel like a metaphor unless we really unpack it. An example is that time is money. It's so imbued into our ways of thinking about time that it's hard to unpack the layers, like time is money, and therefore time is a limited resource, and therefore time is valuable. Those different aspects are what Lakoff calls entailments of the metaphor. They illustrate different parts of the way that we think about time. Similarly, this metaphor of some software as a platform is a conventional metaphor, and we use it all the time, and it also has a bunch of entailments that are interesting to think about. Like, what would it mean to be a platform? In and of itself, platforms are useful. They can elevate you above a crowd. You can shout from them and be heard. You can build a yurt on them, and the yurt won't sink into the mud when it rains. 
uh, you could build them up into a giant scaffolding and uh, climb up to the top and watch a Quidditch match or something. I'm not sure what this one is about. But if you're in the platform business, you're not in the business of building things for yourself necessarily. You're building things to allow other people to build on top of your platform. This is Steve Yegge. Uh, he's a super sharp guy. Uh, you can Google Y-E-G-G-E -E, uh, platform rant to get the full version of from which this is an excerpt. He is also the king of the career limiting move. As a Google employee, he posted this long screed that was intended to take a Google to task for not treating their own software as a platform um, to his public Google Plus account. And uh, he didn't get in, in trouble necessarily for it. Uh, he didn't get fired or anything, but it definitely caused perhaps more of a stir than he had originally intended. He also um, publicly quit his job while he was giving an OSCON keynote or quit the project that he was working on. He sort of walked it back later, but uh, he said, he was giving a talk about how we should use our time to work on projects which are meaningful, not just to us, but meaningful to the world at large, and realized as he was talking that he had just signed up to uh, make a lolcat generator at Google, and that didn't really fit with his internal uh, system of, of morality, so he decided to quit. Um, anyways, the important part for, about the platform rant for me are here in boldface, if you have a a platformless product, you can be replaced by an equivalent something that, that does have a platform on it. And secondly, the golden rule of platforms of eating your own dog food, it says start with a platform and then use it for everything. So even if you have a platformized sort of software package, you can still be displaced if you do it wrong. The question becomes, what's Puppet's platform like? What characteristics does it have? I think there's two parts to it, modules and APIs, and I'll talk about the modules first. Modules in Puppet are sort of the primary part of our platform, which again is a weird metaphor if you think about it, how can a platform be made up of modules? But um, I, I think it makes sense. These are the modules that make up the International Space Station, and I think modularity, which is the desirable, one of the desirable properties is, of these modules, is pretty close to how Puppet works. They're interoperable. Uh, the color coding here shows that there are um, multiple international space agencies that are contributing to the space station, and some of the modules are manufactured in Japan, some in the US, some in, in Europe, some in Russia, and they're all able to interoperate with each other in an airtight way, literally in this case, they're in space. Um, they're extensible, they have entry and exit points, and inputs and outputs, so the space station could start out with just a few elements and add more over time. They're encapsulated, again, literally they are ca capsules that are sent up into space, but, but that means that they're each sort of independent of one another, so the internals of it are self-contained, and they can do lots of different things. Even given all of these constraints, there's everything from uh, living quarters to a gym to science uh, modules that allow you to uh, expose experiments to solar radiation, and uh, astute observers may note that these characteristics are mirrored in the principles of object-oriented programming from which Puppet modules steal a lot of their language and a little bit of their implementation. So these definitions here come from Raymond, Raymond Llewellyn and sort of mirror the, the four properties that I just described. I'm going to use them in slightly different terms than straight OO programming because at Puppet one of the things that we've uh, come to terms with is that we're just terrible at naming things. Uh, so some of these concepts are overloaded or slightly different from what they would mean if you're taking a OO programming class, but um, bear with me again. So abstraction allows you to build up complex behaviors uh, from relatively simple pieces. This is Hunter's WordPress module, which uh, glues together a bunch of disparate modules to make a functioning WordPress installation. Inheritance in this context, and this is, I admit, a little bit of a stretch, uh, it means that we can decouple the versions of the different, those different components and not have to release everything in lockstep. Encapsulation means that the API is consistent and the API is all that's visible from outside of the module. All you need to know um, are, in Puppet's case, what the parameters are that a particular class takes in order to uh, uh, change how it functions in your environment and that encapsulates the internals of it nicely. And polymorphism here means that you could swap out the web server in the WordPress module, you know, change Nginx for Apache if you felt like it, and you wouldn't have to necessarily change the database server. 
So people are doing all kinds of real work today completely in modules, like the AWS module, which represents a few dozen uh, Amazon APIs in a puppet-friendly manner, and the NetConf and Yang work, which provides interfaces to Cisco network devices. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about the Forge itself as a platform in a minute, but just think for a minute about how some of these same characteristics might apply to a content marketplace. There are other parts of Puppet, as I said, that exhibit platform-like behavior. They provide some or all of these nice properties, and they allow both the bits that we think of as Puppet itself to do new things, as well as things external to Puppet to do new things. So other integrations that use Puppet as a platform under the hood are things like Foreman, which now supports Puppet 4 with some deep integrations under the hood. We had to work pretty closely with the Foreman team in order to get uh, Foreman working uh, with the changes that came around in Puppet 4, but now it, uh, it works really well. And part of being a good platform is keeping your APIs uh, consistent and when you change them to make that visible to the uh, external consumers of them. VMware has super extensive hooks into from everything from provisioning to no classification, and uh, there's a new version of the VRA plugin which is being demoed this week that uh, sh really builds on some of these platform APIs in a really powerful way. VMware is sort of floating above the platform because of how heavily they've invested in the cloud. Um, we have Azure and AWS. I mentioned the AWS module, but in addition to that, we're doing a lot of work with Amazon lately to figure out cloud provisioning and uh, the APIs that we're demoing. So it's a pretty it gets to be a pretty crowded platform up there, so we have to make it bigger or something, I guess. Let's talk uh, now about Puppet. I mentioned that we're going through the platform roadmap for Puppet. We did the platform bits. Now let's talk about Puppet. Puppet is what Lakoff calls a systematic metaphor, but it's a novel metaphor. It's not one that automatically suggests itself when we think about automation software. There are other metaphors that could be used, but the idea is that you know, the central sort of organizing principle of Puppet is that automation is like a puppet. Your understanding of which puppet I'm talking about could be open to interpretation. I mentioned entailments earlier, which are the cognitive implications of the metaphors that you use. And the, the systematicity of these metaphors is pretty rich, of, these, of the entailments is rich. So Chef, for instance, have a knife subcommand, and they have uh, cookbooks and recipes, and their version of the forge is called the supermarket. Uh, the problem with tying everything into the metaphors is that uh, they might become stale. They might dry up, your inspiration might dry up. Um, in Puppet, we try not to get too cute about, about what we're doing, but some things are unavoidable. So we end up with things like str Puppet Strings, Marionette Collective, and uh, the Puppet Master, obviously. So Puppet may be the central metaphor, but increasingly the code that is the core of Puppet itself, the stuff that's in the repository on GitHub that's named Puppet, is just part of a bigger ecosystem. It's a collection of Puppet and Puppet-related things, let's say. So uh, there's some examples like the Puppet Agent Bundle is probably a, the most prominent one that people are familiar with. We used to just have Puppet by itself, and now the Puppet Agent Bundle includes Ruby, Factor, Hira, all together in one download. So instead of the standalone Puppet package, you get a collection of things, and that's you know like Lewis and Gordon and Loretta, Bob, and Bert and Ernie. Um, in a sense, the puppet agent came about because the, there, we recognize that these pieces all rely on one another. And to extend the ecosystem metaphor a little bit, sure, you could, people do, can and do run factor by itself, but it's not particularly useful. It's better to have all of the uh, related software in one, uh, uh, at, at one time. So uh, keep this idea about our automation software being like an ensemble cast of puppet and humans doing cool things together uh, in mind. And finally, let's talk about the roadmap for a minute. In the physical domain, a roadmap is a specific kind of map. It's meant to aid navigation by car. It's gotten really overloaded in the context of software because it's not really a static thing that you look at. It's more like a description of the plan for a future, which opens up an interesting set of metaphors about our conception of time and how time works, if we think about the idea that future plans are like a roadmap. So to think about time for a moment, we actually have two sort of apparently contradictory metaphors that we use to conceptualize time. Both are what George Lakoff calls orientational metaphors, meaning they map 
aspects of our understanding of the physical world around us onto ideas that, that, uh, don't, that aren't inherently about the outside world. So a super simple example is like happy is up, which gives rise to sayings like that boosted my spirits or I'm really depressed. In this case, one of the metaphors is that we think about time as an object that moves towards us, which leads, leads, to, leads to statements like, the next release is coming soon, or I'm really looking forward to the party tonight. And this is apparently in contradiction to another sort of spatial orientational metaphor, which is the idea that time is stationary and we are moving through it. And this leads to concepts, like, or leads to statements like, we're now approaching the time when Eric gets to the point. But even though these things seem to contradict one another, they're coherent in the sense that they're relative to us. The future is in front, the past is behind us, and time goes past us from front to back, whether we're moving or time is. So they're co coherent with one another, even if those entailments are somewhat inconsistent. So we're looking ahead to the following week. It's you know, sort of a strange way to think about it, but uh, and, and it leads to some um, cognitive dissonance, I would say. So back to our roadmap. What do we actually want from a roadmap for software? We want to know what's coming out in the future, when we can expect to see it, um, what we should do differently so that our work aligns with some new features. And in this sense, a static roadmap is not itself very useful, but something like Google Maps that shows your various optional routes between a starting point and a common destination is a really nicely systematic metaphor. It shows where we're going, which is ideally to green flash brewing shows how long it's gonna take, uh, given your chosen mode of transport, in my case, a bicycle. And it gives me some route options, so I can choose whether I wanna go along the beach or I wanna go up in the hills and get some climbing in. Um, so this, this feels like a pretty nice set of entailments to use when we're talking about software, but uh, it can be perilous, though, particularly in the case of, uh, of, of uh, Puppet software. What if you can't get where you're going the way you wanna travel there? What if the destination isn't actually known? What if the route, once you start, has obstacles that show, don't show up on the map? So here's the part of the talk where if it were an old map, I would, it would be labeled, here be dragons. So as far as Puppet's concerned, we really wanna turn the concept of modules and the Forge itself into more of a platform. We're already distributing a ton of content through the Forge, and that content is pretty reusable, but I think there's two important parts where we need to improve. The first one is the modules themselves need to be more reusable and pluggable. I think the Puppet data type system uh, becoming pervasive is super important to this because without the data types, there's no way to look at a module to, uh, uh, and say uh, represent a enable or disable flag as a radio button uh, in, a, in a GUI that only lets you select one or the other because it's only true or false. Um, other important pieces that are coming are the ability to mark parts of the interface or even entire class as private so that you only the parts of the implementation that you want to expose are actually visible. And for the Forge itself, we're distributing content now. There's a ton of stuff up on the Forge, but uh, this, this was from a few days ago and there were 4,500 modules on there, which is uh, pretty tremendous if you think about it. Um, it's not a platform in the same way that like Steam or the um, Apple App Store are for their respective content ecosystems. Uh, there's a place to stage your content and make it discoverable, but it'd be great if there was a way to potentially get paid through doing that, to differentiate content that's, a, that's um, supported by ourselves, supported by partners, supported by a third party that, that wrote the content and um, intends to, to provide support for it. We have the supported and approved programs and uh, we need to continue to, to uh, improve those and enhance those over time. And as far as the platform APIs go, we wanna continue to build on the platform we have and maybe decorate it a little better, dress it up and make it fancy. As a practical matter, this means making more APIs public and we've done a lot of work on this in the Puppet 3 series and throughout the Puppet 4 where um, particular parts of both the Ruby APIs as well as the endpoints were documented, parts were marked public and private, and you were able to um, rely on those interfaces remaining consistent between versions. I think the next big one is the Run Puppet endpoint, which started off as a PE only uh, and internal only API, but um, 
we, if we want to make certain behaviors like the direct change workflow that was demoed earlier today uh, ubiquitous, they need to be open APIs that have an implementation that everyone can use. So we're looking at rolling an implementation in, baked into the Puppet server that will allow you to run the Puppet job command and uh, execute those direct change workflows across your, uh, across your fleet for open source users as well as for PE. And I think there's still great opportunity to add value, and I think a model for how we want to think about platform APIs and how we're going to work moving forward is sort of like um, how the static catalog endpoint works today, where if you buy PE, you get an out-of-the-box experience that automatically synchronizes your files um, and has that, that change promotion workflow built, built into it. Um, but the endpoints are pluggable, and there are reference scripts on the documentation site, and I believe even in the, in the, the um, server bundle that you download that allow you to configure the same two parts of that cycle, the one that checks the, uh, the Git file store for a checksum and inserts it into the catalog, and the second one which retrieves the content given that checksum when a file request comes in. Those endpoints are totally configurable and allows you to uh, customize it to your environment and uh, extend it if you need to. I feel pretty confident, though, that some things are going to stay commercial. I mean, we are a business in the business of selling software, and there's clearly things like um, a role-based access control service where uh, if, it, if it turns out that there are certain operations that you want certain people to either have view only or access to and not be able to write them or not be able to do anything, that that probably means that the things that you're trying to lock down are worth money to you, and I feel like we should be able to uh, convince you that some of that, uh, some of that money uh, should go to developing the software that enforces those policies for you. So trying to pick and choose individual endpoints and baseline functionality as a point of differentiation, I think we're trying to unwind some of those decisions and try to, try to think about things more holistically and provide real, really great uh, platform experience for people to, to build upon. And for Puppet itself, this is the same cast from the 70s, uh, and is, but is a, a modern day uh, photo of them. There's a big cast of characters, things have evolved over time, and my main charter for the Puppet pe portions of the platform are first to not introduce uh, language level backwards incompatibilities to the extent that we did between Puppet 3 and Puppet 4. I know it was uh, and has been a huge effort for people to upgrade their code bases, to get things working on Puppet 4, and we need to be uh, better in the future about layering in new functionality in ways that don't break compatibility and don't require you to go back and revisit code that you wrote. And I'm pretty willing to plant a uh, line in the sand and say that if you have, uh, although there may be Puppet, for, there will be future versions of Puppet that are major versions. There's not going to be uh, a requirement that if you have code that's running on Puppet 4 that you're going to have to rewrite it uh, when a Puppet 5 comes out or even potentially uh, 6.0 or something like that. We are going to consolidate on the Puppet server side of the stack, so one of the things that is, uh, has been on its way out and uh, as we've introduced more of that, uh, more functionality like the certificate authority and the um, file content retrieval service into the Puppet server, we still maintain compatibility with the rack and passenger sort of world, and that stuff is, is going away uh, hopefully soon, although I don't have a particular uh, line, uh, date in mind when that's gonna come out. We do wanna make it easier too for people outside of Puppet to use the build tools and compose agent bundles that suit them. So to that end, Mike Sankey, uh, yes, just yesterday, I think, open sourced the Puppet Lab, uh, the PL build tools repo, which is the tooling internally which we use to generate the, uh, the Puppet agent build. So if, for instance, you wanted to get it running on a platform that we don't currently build for, say FreeBSD, uh, you now have the entire tool chain available to, to do that, and we would welcome patches to add new support for operating systems that aren't, aren't built in-house. Uh, and lastly, I've been talking about this for a few years, but I think we finally have uh, our, our shit together, frankly, to uh, modularize Puppet itself and to take the, the thing that we have in the, you know, again, in the, the Puppet Labs Puppet repo and um, split out parts of it into sort of a core modules kind of concept so that things like the operating system types and providers can live in their own repositories, they can live in modules, and we as we 
build agent, you know, a Puppet agent version can pick which independent versions of those modules ought to be included with the with the Puppet agent. The model here that I think works pretty well, although I haven't, I, this, the, this metaphor may itself be an exact, is sort of how uh, Perl core works, where Perl is made up of a bunch of different modules, which each individually live on CPAN, but are composed together so that when you download Perl, you get a batteries included sort of thing and not just an interpreter. I'll leave you with one more metaphor, which is that knowledge is light, and we have these entailments around that, like I'm totally in the dark about it, and then I had a bright idea that illuminated the problem and brought in the sharp relief, or maybe the world is controlled by the Illuminati, so forth. Um, so I hope that this talk shed some light on the future of our platform roadmap. I finished early, so I do have time for questions if you'd like any, if you have any questions about anything I've talked about or things that I have uh, elided. Um, thanks. Nary a question. All right, thank you very much. Oh, Ryan, oh, shit, Ryan, Ryan destroyed the applause line. Sorry, I was gonna try to throw you a bone here. I was just curious, what, what in the last year has come out in the Puppet platform that you're pretty excited about? The last, the last year's development. Yeah, since last platform. Puppet Conf. Yeah, uh, well, I would say definitely the, the, um, the evolution of, this, of static catalogs and making that work, that was something that has been in Puppet since two, Seven, I believe, there, there was, was the first static compiler endpoint. It was never uh, finished, and it certainly was never made the default. And we spent a bunch of time uh, early, late last year and early this year uh, really working through all the edge cases and making sure that if you wanted to, uh, you could have a, you know, a fully uh, operational battle station of a static catalog compiler. Um, and if people haven't heard about that, I talked about it a little bit at the Contributor Summit yesterday. But uh, this is uh, a thing that allows you to um, insert the checksums, as I mentioned earlier, into the catalog as it's being compiled for file resources that have a puppet colon slash slash URL for where to fetch the file from. So this both reduces the number of round trips that the agents have to make to request catalog metadata every time they run and uh, make sure that when a file is different that it can be retrieved by a checksum from the server and so you're guaranteed to get the version of the file that matched the time the catalog was compiled instead of whatever happens to be sitting at that location on the file server at the time the agent checks in. So it closes a loophole in, in sort of correctness as well as provides a pretty awesome performance boost. Uh, the chart I showed yesterday briefly before the um, AV setup in the other room caught on fire was of a uh, 1,200, 1,250 agents running a simulated load against a server with static catalogs on that was uh, half the agent runtime of fewer of uh, 1,000 agents running with static catalogs off. So it's, it's pretty, pretty powerful performance boost and I think that's probably, that's probably the, the biggest thing. Thank you very much. Um, I'm a I'm a big fan of um, models and having a, a good model of the world that we try to make sense of. And I think Puppet is a very good model. Um, which way do you think Puppet is going to push metaphors and like how is it going to create new models to view this new world that we are trying to manage? That's a good question. I have to think about that for a minute. So, um, yeah, I mean, Puppet is all about, as Luke said this morning, modeling and abstraction and abstracting away the details of what you're trying to run from the, way, the code that you have to write or the, the, the way that you have to think about it. I think the, f well, the first one and sort of the most obvious one to reach for is the, um, the application modeling stuff where in now instead of uh, being, only being able to describe the relationship between resources on a single node, you can describe the relationship between different nodes in your infrastructure. And that sort of is the same uh, cognitive model that we're used to thinking about resources, but it's um, you know, a meta level, a level out from, from that that, that um, allows you to, yeah, f p to build a, uh, build a model of a complex application. So th that's kind of the, the, 
primary one I would, I would suggest that we're, we're thinking about and working on. Um, I think that the, the trick is really, uh, I, the next step for me is to think about how to remove resources from having to be um, expressed as belonging on a particular node. So right now, anything you have, uh, with the exception of an um, environment uh, application model, uh, even if it's a Amazon instance that is its own node, we sort of force you to apply that to a given node. And you have to think about those uh, Amazon resources as belong being classified onto and being run on a particular node, when in fact, it's, there, you know, there's, that, that, that's sort of a conceptual mismatch. And what actually is the, the, the right metaphor, the right, the right way to think about that is that there's just some entity uh, which is responsible for ensuring the correctness of those resources and correct, you know, attempting to correct them if they're, if they're adrift. And that that's not necessarily tied to a given node, that it's just uh, they're, they're out there somewhere. It might be an API that you're hitting. It might be a network device. Uh, we don't want to necessarily have to run an agent on every single device and apply the resources onto it. We want to have a central sort of service that is responsible for uh, ensuring those things. And I think that's kind of the next step in that, in that evolution. I think we'll probably finish there. Thank you very much.